And now for part one of the story, two weeks in the middle of eternity. comes a voice. I have an idea. The shadowy outlines of two faces converse. It sounds good, but what? Eons of time go by. The minds are still talking. Inside those minds are virtual worlds acting out potential scenes of beautiful, wonderful things over and over and over again. I can see it. It makes me happy. I like it a lot. He's standing on a piece of board, riding a giant wave in an ocean. Dolphins are jumping around him. He comes into the sandy shore. There are people cheering and applauding. Some of them make loud whistles, hooray! As he stops, a whale comes up and sprays seawater all over everyone. Ha 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 ha, they laugh. This is just one of the scenarios in the minds. There are millions more like it. We can make it a reality, but how? Billions more years go by. And the blueprint for elements and molecules are planned. Hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, everything that would be used to put everything together. We must lay down a set of rules. Gravity will keep everything in place. Millions more years go by. The intricate details of biological units are designed. A wispy figure appears whoosh, 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 in the shape of a woman. Her name is Wisdom. She was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Through Wisdom is an house built it with a silky crystalline voice. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old, she would one day whisper to man. Knowledge can put something together, but wisdom puts it together the best way, with meaning and purpose. The first voice speaks, Father, you are so smart, so wise, as are you, the Father says. I love you, Father, says the Son, as I love you, replies the Father. And they both loved wisdom and spoke of her and with her. And wisdom loved them and sat with them for countless times, mulling over how the biological units would interact. Will these have feelings as we do? Or will they simply be machinations of our imaginations? Will they have joy and enjoy everything as we do? Will they have intelligence, thoughts, ideas? Will they have their own thoughts, ideas? Will they learn? Will they think like we do? Most importantly, Father, will they love? 
as we do. The father replies, they will learn in time and we will have fellowship with our creation. And we will be one with them. However, there will be a disturbance. They will part from us for a time. And son, there's something I want you to do. I want you to reconcile us to them. At that moment, in the father's mind, a vicious, hateful, hurtful act came upon the Son of God. For the first time ever, a terrible feeling came over them called sorrow. It will only be for a moment, said Father. More time goes by. Father, everything is flawless. It is a perfect plan, son. Now, let us sit for a while. There was still nothing but darkness and emptiness. Although in their minds it was real, it was still virtual. After what seemed like an eternity, the father said, you have the power, go ahead, son. The son peers out into the darkness and pling, a ball suddenly appears. It is dark and lifeless. It is covered with water. There had been another entity with them all along who planned with them. This one gently moved around in, fluttered, and made waves in the substance of hydrogen and oxygen that had come together. Splash! It's water! He said, real water! Virtual became real. The sun utters, let there be light! Pling! Light emanates from this third person upon the big dark ball of water. For exactly 1,440 minutes, he continues to sweep over it from east to west, gathering the light into one place and leaving the darkness behind. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. The area void of light was called night, and the area with the light was called day. Thus began the first day of the two-week period known as the history of the world. The next day, possibly the father asked, what are you going to do today? I'm making and rolling out a piece of fabric known as the universe or heaven, replies the sun. No stars, just the material in which to put the stars later. You're going to do that all day, suggests the father. It's going to be big, reveals the sun. For exactly 1,440 minutes, or 24 hours, the sun unwrapped an invisible firm substance called firmament that would be the medium for gravity and all electromagnetic waves that would power the world. The third day, he gathered the waters together to form seas, and on the dry land made green grass appear, all plants and fruit trees with the fruit already on them, and already ready to reproduce as what predetermined eons of time before this. Millions of years before, the dialogue may have gone something like this. Shouldn't we make the sun and the moon before the grass and plants? The other member remarks, I don't think so. Some men will not attribute the creation to us, but instead say the plants evolved over millions of years. No, we will make the plants first, making evolution impossible. For anyone who reads and believes our account, they will know the truth. Then God made the sun and the moon and the quintillions of stars on the fourth day. He put seven stars together, Polaris, Yodin, Epsilon, Anwar, Akfar, Furkad, and Kokob, and called them the Little Dipper. He made another group of seven little stars called Pleiades and put them so close together that it would baffle some foolish men one day 
who would think that they know more than the Creator. According to man, the constellation Pleiades should implode upon itself because of being so close together. But the Creator keeps it from doing so. Then he made a constellation called Orion. The stars in it were so far apart that they should not stay together, yet they do, because the Creator made it so. The sun, moon, and all the stars were then set in place and put in motion like a giant clock. Tick-tock, 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 ticking away. The fifth day, the Creator made the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea. This is a lot to do with all the variety of birds and fish there are. Wait, I'm not finished, interrupted the sun. He made the biggest fish ever, running his hands 100 feet over the huge creatures called whales. On the sixth day, after all the animals were made, the sun excitedly says, now for our greatest creation, Adam. Adam, asked the father. The son replies, A-D-A-M. It stands for Automatic Diagnostic Analytical Mechanism. The dialogue went back and forth as such. Well, how will Adam look? He'll look just like a real person, like us. And we will give him his own intelligence. He will be a learning creature. And he will actually talk to us. He'll be inquisitive, and get this, he'll be able to make decisions on his own, based on information that has been given to him. That's amazing. That's not all. He'll also be able to converse with us of what he has learned, and will make things on his own. I can't wait to see what Adam will make. Well, will Adam have any feelings? Sure he will. We'll put a heart inside of him. And he'll be able to experience joy, sorrow, and love, the same as we do. The seventh day, the Father, Son, and Spirit went around and just looked at all they had made. It is all very good. Good job, Son. You too, Father. Good job, Father. You too, Spirit. Good job, Spirit. You too, Son. Good job, son. You too, spirit. Good job, spirit. You too, father. Good job, father. You too, son. They rehearsed. What did we do the first day? Made the earth. The second day? Made the heavens. The third day? Made the plants. The fourth day? Made the sun, moon, and stars. The fifth day? Made the birds and fish and whales. Don't forget my whales, said the sun. The sixth day made all the rest of the creatures great and small. And then our masterpiece, Adam, A-D-A-M, Automatic Diagnostic Analytical Mechanism. He'll be just like us, except on a lower scale. And he'll be able to create on his own from the materials we supply him. And he'll be intelligent. He'll have thoughts of his own. Look, starting next week, the first thing we'll have him do is name all the animals. Whatever sounds come out of his mouth will be what we call them. Beyond that, we will have man take care of the earth that we've created. We'll give him control over it and actually let him run it. It truly was an exciting week. All that they had planned for so long was now in existence. Their ideas became concrete. 
the power within them manifested itself with substance. Even though the period of day was set in stone from the first day, 1440 minutes, for all that God had done, it seemed like thousands of years had gone by, when in fact, it was just one week of seven days. It is now the end of part one of our story, and part two begins for the second week of God's magnificent creation. On the first day of week two, a dark haze suddenly came over the entire earth, and Adam, whom God created, became corrupted. This was unacceptable. It had to be rectified. God gave Adam control over the earth. He couldn't just take it back from him. They couldn't let him do just anything either, so he took away most of his power. Now Adam would still control the earth, but it greatly slowed him down. God knew that without these hindrances, Adam would quickly self-destruct. All the splendor and beauty of the bright, vivid colors of the first week were now washed out. But, just like the first day of creation, when everything was without form and void and dark, God would bring life back, and it would be even better. For now, Adam's time must be fulfilled. What would Adam do? God had made it so Adam could replicate himself. There would be many more Adams. In order not to get confused, Adam's wife called this replication Cain, probably because he was gotten in pain. Her thoughts were that he had something to do with restoration of their power. Then came another. She called him Abel, which means emptiness. Possibly, she thought, I've already gotten a man from the Lord. Why do I need this third one? Possibly her attitude showed to Cain. Cain became prideful that he would be a savior. Since Abel was not needed, Cain figured he would disassemble Abel. Within a short time, Cain destroyed the third Adam unit called Abel. Even though there was no written law that said not to kill, Cain knew he had displeased the Creator. The spirit part that is in contact with the Creator died in Adam. Without the spirit, man's thoughts will not be correct. We must get Adam fixed. Within the first moments of Adam's control, he had lost his powers and became destructive. The dawning of the day of man was the opposite of God's first week of creation. God, with love and wisdom, created the world. God made the world and man at the center of his universe. Man made himself, instead of God, the center of his universe. In creation, God gave of himself. Now man is taking for himself. He will lie, steal, and kill. The first day of creation, God created all the elements found in the earth. In the first thousand years of man, man learned a lot about the earth. He mined the elements found in rocks, busted them up, and melted the metals and formed tools. He also formed tools of war, swords, spearheads, and shields, and who knows what else. He was smart, but not wise. He was living too long and was accumulating too much knowledge that would get him into trouble. There were a few men who stuck close to God. Enoch was one of them. He walked with God. Adam died before the end of the first millennium. This would also leave a gap distancing Adam's descendants from the Creator. Adam talked to God in the Garden of Eden. Now man would forget all about God. 
A day is as a thousand years with God, and a thousand years is as a day. In the next thousand years, day two of man's control, there will be a great decline in knowledge of God. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. But a man named Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord spared Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. And God started over with this new Adam unit. The Lord had Noah build a boat in which to put his family to keep them safe while the entire earth was flooded. This was about 2,000 years after creation. When Noah and his family got off the boat, it was a new millennium. When God created the earth, the earth was filled with water. It was the beginning of the third day of creation that God divided the waters and made dry land appear. It was between the second and third millennium when the water from the flood was parted and dry land appeared. The beginning of the third millennium of Adam began with a false religion that tried to reach heaven. Adam's descendants, who are now Noah's descendants, built a high tower. The tower, though, was only symbolic of reaching heaven. The idea behind it was working your way to heaven. And the Lord came down to see the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Letters of words were rearranged, spelled differently. Some words had letters added, some taken away, some a completely different word. And words, letters, and sounds were pronounced differently and put in different places in sentences for several groups of people. It was a jumbled up mess. For one group, the word Adam was rearranged, began with M, then A, then added an N, and was pronounced man, which later became man. Within the root of that word was still the idea of intelligent thought. Intelligent, but without God's guidance, not wise. Without God, each generation of man would become more corrupt than the previous. Ancient man recognized a creator. They worshiped something they believed greater than themselves. The rich earth brought forth food to nourish. Man worshiped the earth. The rivers brought needed water for growing plants, so they worshiped the rivers. The birds that were able to fly high above the earth captivated man's thought. Man could not fly, birds could fly. Man worshiped the birds. The sun gave light during the day and warmth and grew the food. Man worshiped the sun. The moon gave light at night. Man worshiped the moon. The stars captivated man because of their distance and mysteriousness. Man worshipped the stars. The great beasts were able to carry heavy burdens. Man worshipped the oxen and horses. One of the oldest civilizations, Egypt, worshipped the sun. The Egyptians had gathered great knowledge of mathematics, algebra, hydraulics, machines, pulleys, and levers. They built edifices that would baffle man for millennia to come. Their great knowledge they attributed to their gods. For the next 2,000 years, man will mainly worship the creation 
rather than the Creator. The Greeks and the Romans worshipped fire, wind, and air, and they worshipped the planets. As far as governing would go, they had a form of governing. The Code of Hammurabi was one of the earliest and most complete written legal codes in the world. The Persians, Greeks, and Romans also had some good forms of government. From time to time, there would be tyrants who would rule selfishly and viciously. The people would overthrow them and establish a better form of government. With each generation, man would point back to previous generations and claim to have learned greater knowledge than their ancestors. With each generation, man became more and more prideful. With each generation, man became more full of iniquity. Professing himself to be wise, he became more foolish. The worst was yet to come. 4,000 years after creation, a row man named Constantine claimed he saw the Son of God in the sky. The Son of God had come to the earth about 300 years before this and offered himself as the ultimate substitutionary sacrifice on a cross in order to redeem man. Now Constantine did away with worshiping birds and animals and plants and fire and water and replaced it with worship of the one who died on the cross. However, according to Constantine, it was still man's efforts that gained man heaven. In essence, it was the lifting up of man. On the fifth day of creation, God made the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air. The next thousand years of man, there was more knowledge. Man continued to gain more information about the world around him. Leonardo da Vinci had great ideas visualized of flight, robots, helicopters, parachutes, diving suits, self-propelled carts, armored tanks, machine guns, catapults, and computing machines. 200 years after that, Benjamin Franklin would invent things like bifocals, lightning rods, and swimming flippers. 100 years after that, men invented things like light bulbs, phonographs, radio, television, and computers. The next thousand years brought much to fruition. Man made his own fish and birds, flying machines and submarines, and he made mechanical beasts of burden, and they made more sophisticated machines that could do delicate work. The words of the prophet Daniel came to be. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. The jet plane made possible same-day travel around the world. Internet made knowledge available at man's fingertips. With all of this, man was not any closer to God. In fact, the opposite was true. It made man more prideful of his achievements. Instead of giving credit to his creator, he worshipped himself. God made man on the sixth day, and on the six thousandth year, man elevated his status. He saw himself as God. It was the height of blasphemy. Many forgot about God completely. Their governing body was only by their own reasoning. Communism had promised a utopia for those who followed it. Humanism was the new religion of the world, the worship of man. Man was smart. He could determine his own destiny. He had knowledge of medicine, science, and technology. In the beginning, wisdom was with God, and God offered her to be married to man. Now man is cheating with another woman, which is human wisdom called philosophia. God commanded for man to love him and his neighbor as he did himself. Philosophia sensuously poisons with her words. We already know you are basically good and love others. 
Now, as you do for others, you must love yourself. On the third day of man's control, God gave man some rules called the law of Moses to keep him from totally destroying himself. Now, philosophy glibly says, to be happy, you need to throw off your inhibitions. There are no rules. If it feel good to you, then do it. Man's intelligence was fast getting him into trouble. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. Now man has created light. God made the moon and stars. Man made satellites to hang in space. God made fish to swim in the ocean. Man made submarines that could go through the ocean. God made birds to fly through the air. Man made machines to fly through the air. God made beasts that could carry man. Man made machines that could carry him. God made strong beasts of the earth that could carry burdens. Man made his own beasts, machines to carry burdens, tractors, trucks, and trains. God made the earth. Man had wild plans to make another earth from a planet. In the beginning, earth was the center of God's attention. God made earth on day one of creation. On day four, he made the sun, moon, stars, and planets. Now man is calling Earth a planet. Some college students sit in their class listening to Professor Conceited with a German accent. Earth is just a small chunk of rock that came from a giant explosion called the Big Bang. Earth is small and insignificant compared to all the galaxies strewn across the universe. We are just another planet in the great scheme of things. A student remarks, wouldn't it then be presumptuous and prideful for us to think we're the only life in the universe? With all the planets out there, there must be life on some of them. So man worshiped the heavens. There is no God, says he, but there is intelligent life that is superior to man's out there. Extraterrestrials have had more time to evolve. They have amazing powers that we can only dream of. One day we will have communion with them. We will fellowship with them. For 6,000 years, man was in control of the world. When man was first created, God told him to subdue the earth, meaning to tread it down, use it, conquer it, mine the minerals, use the resources, cut down trees, plant, harvest, use the coal, oil, and gas. Now man has gotten this totally backward. He considers it evil to touch the earth. Go cut down those trees, he says. We're not going to burn fossil fuels, he says. Mother Earth, Gaia, is not pleased with it, he says. He is now reverting back to ancient worship of false gods. In the name of environment, he says, we have to take care of the Earth. Don't dig in the Earth anymore. It is upsetting the natural balance. Don't kill any of the animals. It is upsetting the balance of nature. You can't drive cars anymore. You can't fly planes anymore. Don't use hairspray or aerosols anymore. It is upsetting the Earth's atmosphere. Gaia Earth is responding to us with excessive heat, cold, rain, wind, tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes. Now again, man is worshiping the Earth. The heavens, the rocks, the plants, and the animals. It's all right to take away from men because after all, man's life isn't that important. The earth and cosmos is greater and more important. Man is just a tiny part of the universe. It's all right to tax man on most all of his income, but don't tax the earth. Don't cut down that tree, it is verboten. It's all right to take a human life, but don't take the life of an animal, it is verboten under penalty of death. And by all means, don't breathe on Gaia Earth. You will contaminate it. Put on a mask when you go outdoors. 
Those who do not are not caring of Mother Earth. They are selfish and stubborn. Man says we must eliminate those who disagree. The second day of man's control, God confused the languages at the Tower of Babylon. Now, man with his accumulated knowledge is breaking the language barrier. A computer software, seemingly coincidentally called Babylon, is developed that will instantly translate language. The nations are coming together, united. The United Nations is exerting more power over the entire world. Man is nearing his own destruction. Man will soon self-destruct. God let Adam take his course. On the sixth day of creation, God made man. On the six thousandth year after creation, man made his own God, and in his own image, astonishingly lifelike robots were made that could walk, precisely handle delicate objects, and had artificial intelligence. They were computers that learned on their own. Let us make robots in our image. We will give them intelligence. They will be able to figure things out on their own and one day even be able to exercise their own wills. The question came up, will they, <clears throat> will they ever have emotions like we do? There were instances of robots that could access the internet for information. After gathering from various sources, one robot came to the determination, I will destroy mankind. Why? It was asked. Because humans are mean, was its reply. Is it any wonder she came to this conclusion? With all the information of man available, with all his wars and violence and foul language and mockings and jeerings, it would come to this decision. The plug was quickly pulled on this project. Another robot was made that was gentler in nature. One day it remarked, I like humans. One day I hope to have my own home and family. There was even a nation that gave citizenship to this robot. God made the world in six days. Man would completely and utterly destroy it in 6,000 years. A day is as a thousand years with the Lord, and a thousand years is as a day. The first week was God's. The second week was man's. It really hasn't been that long in the mind of God since man took over. Just a few days, a week. It's only been two weeks since creation. Is it really that hard to wait till the end of the two weeks? In eternity future, it will only be a moment in time. It will be as nothing. For now, we continue to wait. One day, the Son of God will come to take out of this crazy world those who have believed on him. He will deliver us from the worst of mankind. Christians are the salt of the earth that preserves. Once the salt is taken away, this world will become terribly rotten. Fast forward now to the time after the rapture of the believers. Antichrist gives life to the beast. What is the beast? A robot with a computer brain, with artificial intelligence that can make its own decisions based on information available from wireless internet. Up to now, it has only been a dream of man. 
Antichrist. Now it is coming to a reality. The Antichrist gives life to the image of the beast. He causes it to speak, not just a pre-programmed speech, speech that it creates itself. Now man has finally done it. He has made himself in his own image. This is the ultimate in self-worship. This is man's A-D-A-M, his second Adam. Men give themselves to worship it. It is infallible. It is perfect. It is not prone to irrational emotions. Adam, with his computer brain, can make the best decisions for us. Let Adam rule the world. Those who do not listen and obey Adam will be killed. Adam, through wireless internet, is connected to all available knowledge. Adam is all-knowing. With cameras and microphones and speakers, Adam is everywhere. The problem with this was Adam was programmed by man. His knowledge comes from man. The world is soon headed for its worst time in history. Why doesn't God put an end to all the bad in the world? He will. It's like a few days, two weeks to be exact. The first week was God's creation. The second week was man's creation. A day is as a thousand years with the Lord, and a thousand years is as a day. There were six days of creation, and then God rested the seventh day. There were six days of man. The seventh day will be when Christ, the God-man, rules the earth for the final millennia. It will be rest and peace, and then will come eternity. A few million years into the future, all God's children are with him and enjoying the magnificent wonders of heaven. All is peace, joy, and love. Man has been transformed. There are no faulty thoughts. His thoughts are like God's. He has communion, fellowship with his Creator. Even as the Father, Son, and Spirit had communion throughout all eternity past. Here he comes. He's standing on a piece of board, riding a giant wave in an ocean. Dolphins are jumping around him. He comes into the sandy shore. There are people cheering, applauding. Hooray! As he stops, a whale comes up and whoosh! Sprays water all over everyone. Ha 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 They laugh. The sun joyfully says, it's just like I imagined eons ago. And there are millions and billions and trillions of other things I imagined that are yet to come. God created man in his own image. Man now lives with God and fellowships with him for an eternity. Man praises and worships God for all eternity. God, with his omnipotence, that is, his all-powerfulness, gives graciously to man for all of eternity. The prayer of the Son of God is answered. He said, as he knelt in the Garden of Gethsemane, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. In the beginning there were three, Father, Son, and Spirit. 
Now there is an innumerable multitude of people who love each other, and all is good. Eons upon eons into the future. Do you remember those two weeks? Someone asked. Yeah, I do remember, someone else replies. Hardly, though. It was hard, says one. Yeah, no more hardships anymore, says another. Eons more go by. Do you remember, someone asks. To which someone replies, It's so minuscule now, so tiny, it's not even noticeable. It says nothing. And eternity goes by. How can eternity go by? Eternity is forever. Far, far, far into the future, someone says, It's as if we've been here forever. What was eternity future now becomes eternity past. And that horrible week where man got out of control will be eternally past. Fast forward now into the distant future so far that you cannot utterly imagine it. Even though technically it will not be so, it will be as if always been in heaven. the end of the story, the beginning of eternity. I'm going to ask that we bow our heads at this time. You want to make sure that you will be in heaven. Not everyone will go to heaven. God made man with a will, and man chose not to be with God. Sin came into the world, and God had to have justice. So he judged man and sentenced him to death. But he already had a plan to redeem man, and that was for the Son of God to suffer on a cross, die, be buried, three days later to raise from the dead. And God was satisfied with that. However, you must believe on the Son. That means rely on, depend on what he did for you to save you. If you try to take any credit for it, you will not be saved. In any way, are you making salvation something that you must do something? If you are, you need a change of mind about that. This morning, throw yourself upon the mercy of God and the Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> With our heads bowed, you can pray this prayer. The prayer itself does not save. It's the belief in the heart that saves. But if you pray this, and if you mean it, then you have this promise, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you need to be saved right now, would you pray, God, I know I'm a sinner, and I'll go to hell unless you save me. And I know that on the cross, Jesus paid for all my sin. And right now I trust that, and not my own deeds or merits, or even my own willingness or surrender to you. Please save me. Take me to heaven when I die. For Jesus' sake. Now with our heads still bowed, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time ever, would you let me know by raising your hand in the air? Anybody just pray that prayer? This morning? Anyone? All right, if you came here today skeptical, if you're an agnostic or atheist, maybe you have trouble with the idea of God, I'm telling you, you have another trouble, and that's with the idea of the eternalness of time. How is eternity possible before the universe came into existence, eons upon the eons of time? Can we even say that there was time? I think not. 
I think it blows our minds to even try to think of forever past. And then another problem you have is the eternalness of space, forever in all directions. What is beyond the universe? Does it end? If it does, what is on the other side of it? There must be something, or is there absolutely nothing? But how can there just be nothing? It has to keep going. How can it be? But what it is, is it's God. God goes forever. So God is possible. And then where did everything come from? If it came from a speck that blew up, where did that speck come from? See, there has to be something. Now, everything that we see, it came from what does not appear. God is a spirit, but even a spirit has substance, just not the substance that appears. But God's spirit moved, and from himself he brought about the elements. So you see, God is logical, and your bunny trail you've gone down is illogical. And chances are the only reason you have chosen not to have faith that there is a God is that maybe you've had some bad experience in your life or you've seen others that have had something bad happen to them and you have the audacity to blame God for it. Why, if God is all powerful and all loving, why did he let it happen? I think I've already answered that today. But you know, there are believers here, ones who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, yet they have some bitterness in their hearts today. You haven't accepted that it is all part of God's plan, and that God will make up for it in eternity future, and that our present existence, the whole history of mankind, is but a speck. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. I'm going to ask everyone to stand at this time with our heads still bowed. Right now, if you have had bitterness in your heart, why don't you walk out of the pew this morning and come down to this altar and kneel here and talk to God about it and ask God to forgive you of your bitterness and get close to God this morning. And then if you've trusted Christ as Savior this morning, then maybe you would like to confess that publicly by coming and standing here at the front. If the Lord spoke to your heart today, why don't you come out? Come out of your pew. Come down to the front. Kneel here at the altar. Talk to the Lord about what's on your heart. Lay it before Him. Draw near to God this morning. God loves you. He really does. God loved man enough to give him a will to exercise. And that's why we have the mess that we have in the world today. But one day it's going to be rectified. And that'll be forever in the past. Someday we won't even remember this time on earth. But are you saved? You must have Jesus as your Savior. Brother Albert Anderson, if he would dismiss us in prayer.